science is not immune from sort of like the mob mentality of like, oh my God, like this, this thing is shiny. Let's all go in and periodically things get kind of accepted as some, some form of the truth, right? And people keep kind of like regurgitating them until that, um, right? Until that so-called truth runs into enough uh, tension with the new data that at some point, you know, it usually requires somebody, typically, you know, a graduate student to come in and say, like, uh, I think it's the opposite of what you guys have been saying. And, and then it goes through the usual cycle, uh, which is, again, has parallels. It goes uh, like when new ideas that are, that are very interesting that are put out. First, uh, people say it's wrong. Uh, then people say it's irrelevant. Um, and then they're like, well, actually, I came up with that first. We already knew so, that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was William James who said that first. Do you, can you think of an example of this happening like in your own career where you've seen oh, some, uh, some paradigm take a hard right turn or something like that? Well, you know, I mean, there, there are many of them, but one interesting, one interesting example that comes to mind Actually, um, uh, sort of like the story of how extrasolar planets, uh, the, the story of the first kind of exoplanets that were discovered and their origins. So uh, the kind of first class of exoplanets that were found in large numbers were these objects called hot Jupiters, were giant Jupiter-like planets. But what's weird about them is they or orbit their stars on sort of, sort of in a matter of days. Okay. So when they were discovered the kind of immediate paradigm for how they formed became well they all form just like jupiter and then they all migrate uh through the disk through the natal protoplanetary disk until they stop at the inner edge and that's how they that's how it works okay and everyone sort of agreed that that must be the answer Right. And when people agreed that must be the answer, it sort of became the lore. Um, in parallel, right, it, it again, I, I don't remember who was the first to to point this out, um, but I think it was, but it was sort of a few kind of people come to mind, like the, the papers by Fabriki and Tremaine, where Fabriki was a grad student, right, pointed out that there's a completely different way of making these giant planets, which is that you, Sure, you start them out where Jupiter is, but then you perturb them onto a high eccentricity, very elliptical orbit, and then they kind of get tidally captured onto a tight orbit around the star. So then the community largely shifted towards that being kind of the start, a standard mode of, of the truth. And this is all like in the span of 20 years, right? So these are, these are I don't want to call them fads. These are just kind of, you know, directions of what people believe to be true. Um, and, you know, we've, like, my collaborators and I have um, also thought about this problem a bit, and we're like, wait, all of this, all of these stories start out with the giant planet being somewhere far away, and then, like, migrating all the way down. We're like, what's the evidence for that? What, what is the evidence for uh, everything needing to form you know, where Jupiter is, right? Is it is that not simply our, you know, biased by our own solar system? And to an extent, right, the two things cannot be divorced, right? Our solar system is also a product of the planet formation process. So you can't say our solar system is somehow special and all of these things are, um, are distinct. But nevertheless, we kind of looked into whether or not you can just form these things where they are. And the answer is you can Right. So maybe sometimes the simplest explanation of, you know, can you just accumulate enough solids, right, to make a core of a giant planet and then will it go through its core nucleated instability and grow a large envelope? The answer is that turns out to be yes. So, you know, in just a short span of 25 years, we've kind of gone through a bunch of iterations of what we think is the common outcome. And it's interesting because... I feel like those aren't all mutually exclusive. Like you could have different planet formation mechanisms in different places under different conditions. Like we had uh, Guy Barbazzi on the show a few months ago talking about um, brown dwarfs and really just like how similar they are to gas giants, in, in fact. And 
And then, you know, you couple that to planets migrating orbits and it's like, hmm, maybe, maybe there's something to that as well. It seems like the last century of science has really wanted to be able to have a single story to tell, where this is the story in capital letters. And when you look out at nature, it seems incomprehensible that for the vast diversity of objects that you would have a single linear path towards their formation. I, I think you bring up a really important point, which is that... Um, I think in kind of fundamental physics, right, that that reductionist point of view has been really successful, right? You reduce things down to the very, very kind of core principle, and then from it, everything flows. So I think, you know, that's absolutely uh, been a success. On the other hand, as we go from kind of, as we go higher up in the levels of complexity away from just fundamental physics to kind of examine what the world actually looks like, right, that reductionist point of view begins to fail. Because after all, right, a insect is way more complicated than a star, right? Because star, we can still understand from first principles, right, there's hydrostatic equilibrium, nuclear fusion, and, uh, you know, it's basically a ball of ideal gas. Other And, and yes, there's like, corrections as magnetic fields. But if we ignore kind of the corrections to leading order, we can understand it, but we can't understand an insect from a uh, from first principles point of view. You're not gonna be like, well, okay, let me, let me write down the wave function for an ant and solve the Schrodinger's equation for an ant, right? That just makes no sense. Um, and so planets, you know. And honestly, like the Schrodinger equation starts to, like that gets even overly simple when you even talk about like water molecules or something like as simple as a couple atoms combined, right? It's like, oh, just forget about your simple wave equation. It's like you got like hybridized orbitals and like, I think water has something like 50 different energy state. Like it's all over the place. It's not just this nice P and S orbital business that you learn about. And... Yeah, it's actually, it's a, I've been, uh, I've been sort of obsessing over this this time. There's not a well understood connection between how you graduate from uh, quantum mechanics to the classical world, specifically for chaotic systems, 